They're going to come and sing a song to you today that they have been preparing for, and I know you're going to eat it up, but uh, something else, they have hit a recent milestone, and I want to, and I'm going to come down here, guys, so you can have, and do we need to move this, this pulpit as well? We can do that. Uh, let me get this out of the way. So they have been, thank you, Tommy, just put it right over there by that speaker, please. Um, so they have been, t- started taking up a children's offering for about the last year and a half. And, uh, you know, it really, I mean, they've been robbing all of y'all who are the parents in here. And so if you're like us, we have no change left where we used to have a giant piggy bank. But they have been giving, they have been excited about it. And uh, a couple weeks ago, they passed a huge milestone. So since last year, when we started tracking what they give, the kids, through their weekly offerings, have given over $500. It's amazing. Amazing. And so we're going to use that money to get something very nice for the children's ministry. They've already started on their second half. They're going to raise another $500. Uh, I've been talking with my wife, who is our children's ministry director here at the church. And what we want to do with that next $500 is find a missionary family that uh, is really needy and has the needs for the children. And they want to take that $500 when it gets raised and give it to those kids to help them. Maybe they need some toys. Maybe they need clothes. And really uh, to find an overseas family that could use that. And so what a blessing it is that even children can be uh, just a huge use in the eyes of God. And so we're thankful for that. And so we're going to, amen, absolutely. So at this time, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to turn it over to Miss Linda with the kiddos. people go, oh, yeah, 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 Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go, oh, yeah, 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 from a burning bush told me just the other day that I should come over here and stay, gotta get my people out of Pharaoh's hands and lead them on over to the promised land. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go, oh, yeah, 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 Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go, oh, yeah, 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 well, get my people going to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army was a coming after me, so I raised my rod, stuck it in the sand. And all of God's people walked across the dry land. Amen. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Pharaoh's army was a coming too. So what do you think that I did do? Well, I raised my rod, and I cleared my throat, (coughs) and all of Pharaoh's army did the dead man's float. (laughs) Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa, let my people go. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, whoa. Let my people go. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, we're dismissed. Y'all can go home now. <laughs> Thank you to our kids. That was special. Wow. It's funny. Um, you can hear them. Miss Linda is our growth group teacher at 930. 
we're in here with Brother David, and uh, there are many times where I'm sure Brother David's had to raise his voice a little bit because we can hear that in the back room. It's, oh, oh, we're like, what is going on back there? Well, they were getting ready to sing for y'all, you know, and I think that the Lord uh, is pleased with that. And so thank you, Miss Linda, and uh, for the birds and for all you guys for helping with that. Uh, that's a blessing. We'll be seeing a lot more of that, our kids on stage. I love that. Amen. I think you can do that enough, and it uh, teaches them a culture. And uh, just a love for the Lord, and it's important that we do things not, not for us to even get applause for, but we do it for Him, because He's worthy of those things. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn in them to 1 Peter, chapter number 4. 1 Peter, chapter number 4. We're coming to the last, I think I got, um, if the Lord will allow me to, we have uh, two more weeks in the book of 1 Peter after today. That puts us almost to the holiday time, so we'll be uh, knocking on... Thanksgiving's door at that point, and then we'll be getting into a Christmas series after that to round out the end of the year. So I hope you've been enjoying First Peter. I know it is a, it's not a feel-good book. Uh, it's not a book that's going to uh, leave you maybe feeling great about yourself, you know, like you got baby powder and patted on the rear end, but sometimes we need to hear the hard words. If you're like me, I'm hard-headed. Uh, just like all of us, I struggle with pride myself, and so we come across the book of First Peter, and we know Peter, who was a failure, who struggled with pride, who struggled with putting his foot in his mouth constantly, uh, so he relates to us, but w we need to be put in our place sometimes. We need to hear those hard words. We need to be stripped down of what the world will tell us and even what we want to believe in our own mind and get back to the book and get back to the basics of the Bible. And that's what uh, Peter has been doing here. Uh, and he's got a great message for us in, in this morning uh, as we read this passage. So again, if you have your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter number 4, if you're able to stand with me this morning, we're going to get down through verse 11 by the end of our message today. But I want to begin... Uh, the message by just reading verses 1 and 2. Again, 1 Peter chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 1. It says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Verse 2, That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. The title of our message this morning, Our Living Hope. This is part seven of our series. Let's pray. Father, I just, I beg you, Lord, that you'll be with me over the next several minutes, that you will clear my mind of distractions that the devil may send, that you'll clear my mind of distractions that my own sinful mind uh, would tend to bring up. Lord, that you would just give me clarity, that you would give me your message, Lord, that you need your people to hear today. Lord, I pray for those who have come in here, maybe... Uh, needing that they knowing that they need something but they don't know what it is lord that you would fill their heart with that by the end of our message today lord i pray that we would have open ears that we would have open minds that we would have open hearts as we read the truth of your scripture and lord that we would examine our own lives and when our own lives do not line up with your word lord that uh, your word's not going to change you're not expected to change that we would and i pray this morning for the holy spirit lord that you would can Use the Holy Spirit to convict us of that. Lord, that we would confess our sin and make things right with you before we leave out of here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I do believe with all of my heart that we are living in the last days before Christ returns. And I know that there are all kinds of different views. That's called eschatology. There are some that, uh, you know, maybe pre-trib, some that may be post-trib, some who, many who don't know what you believe and don't even know what those words are that I just said. But I believe that through my convictions and through my reading of Scripture that, that we're coming near the end. And I'm not saying that uh, it's going to be tonight. I don't know that it's going to be next year. We could have 100 years left. Who knows? But when we look at Scripture and what the Bible says on the last days, uh, we know that we have to be near because no man knows the day or time uh, many do in our present day and through history you can study cults of the past and other churches of the past that have tried to put dates and times on it they've said i've done this calendar i've done this thing and and i believe this is uh, god is coming back on july 2nd of 1882 or it's going to have y2k was a big one right god surely god's going to come back in y2k because all of our computers are going to crash and the world's just going to burn in 2000 it's just, it's just going to be uh, just going to be over uh, so man we, we try to put dates upon it but but no one knows but as we look in Scripture, which is all we have and all we need, we know that all of the biblical signs are there. 
We look at passages such as 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you don't have to turn there. Just listen to this. In verses 1 through 5, in chapter 3, it reads this. It says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're in perilous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That, that literally means that the family unit that has always been there, doesn't even, they don't even have true love for one another. There's not even functional families. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Boy, we're seeing that, aren't we? Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then Paul says there, from such turn away. Guys, all of them are there. There's nothing that does not exist in this world. Nothing that, that not only does it not exist, but it's not brought out into the public. And we live literally in the days where good is being called evil, and evil is being called good. I believe we're in the last days. Martin Luther had a very interesting quote. And he said, and it'll be on your screen, Martin Luther said this about the, the last days. He said, what the situation will be like in the world before the Lord returns, namely, Christ will be despised and the preachers of the gospel will be regarded as fools. Now, Christ has always been despised. In Jesus' time on earth, he has said that, but it is more than ever. And of course, people have always thought that your preacher and preachers, that we are fools, right? But, but it's, it's not only just preachers now. You guys are preachers of the gospel as well. And you're made out to be crazy more than ever before. We're the minority. And so why we can study scripture and we know this, that the signs are here. Obviously, we're still here today. So the return of Christ is not. So therefore, it begs this question, how do we live as Christians in the last days? How are we to act? How are we to respond? Again, not just inside the walls of the church with each other, but how do we act in a world that hates us? How do we act out in a world where we're looked at as fools and we're persecuted and ridiculed? We have a mission that Christ has given us. You can go to any of the gospel books and see it. We call it the Great Commission. And Jesus has given you and I this mission as believers that no matter the temperature of the heat outside, that no matter the, the amount of the persecution, no matter the mocking and the ridicules, we have got to get the mission out. We've got to get the message, the gospel, the living hope of Christ to the world. But in order for us to endure these things, in order for us to succeed for Christ in furthering his kingdom, sharing his gospel with the world, we have got to possess a mindset and a certain type of attitude or you're not going to do it, believer. It really is an honor when you think about humanity. When you think about the generations that, that began with Adam and Eve and went on through and we think of Noah and then we think about New Testament times, the times with Paul and the apostles and uh, even through some of the great generations of uh, some of your grandparents and uh, those that we get to where we're at today in the 21st century to know this, that you and I will be able to claim that title of end time Christian. No one else has been able to do that. If the Lord returns in our time, we will be that generation that is here on this earth at the end time. So what should our attitudes look like as believers in 2022? I believe Peter gives us four attributes here in the first 11 verses of this chapter that I want to give you this morning. And the number one attribute is this, that we must possess an attitude of commitment. We must possess an attitude of commitment. Verse 1 again, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Do you know what God is calling you and I to? He's always called us to the, in, in, in our commitments with him. But especially in the latter times, is he is calling us to make the same commitment that, for him that he has made for us. When you think about everything that God has committed to you, 
When you think about not just everything that Christ sacrificed on the cross, but the promises that he's made us, the covenants that he has entered into, the fact that we know that, that when God enters into a saving relationship with a sinful man and a sinful woman, that he holds nothing back, that you will get all of the inheritance, he's calling us to the same commitment back. Because you see, in the last days, We've got to have a commitment to God that's going to be able to endure through great struggles. Now, I don't know when Christ is going to return. And again, there's this whole debate that is it going to happen before the rapture? Is it going to happen halfway through the rapture or halfway through the tribulation? Is it going to happen before, after the uh, tribulation? I, I don't know. My personal stance, I am a pre-tribulational rapture man. Now, let me say this. There are guys that are posting, they're good men, but I hope they're wrong. Because if they're right, we're going to go through a lot through the tribulational period. You're going to go through persecution like you've never experienced before. I mean, thinking about having to meet in a secret location underground with no projectors and no lights and maybe probably no air conditioning and no handsome guys back in the, the booth that are back there, you know, creating all of this experience for you. And to know that if we were to get busted and caught that we could be killed just because we have a Bible, that's foreign to us. But those times are coming. And when those times come, because see, even if Christ comes before the tribulation, we still don't know how bad it's going to get. And I think it's going to get a lot worse. We've got to have a commitment. We've got to have a strong commitment that's not just going to quit at the first time it gets hard. That's not just going to run away when it starts to get awkward and uncomfortable. That the first time my physicality starts to be threatened, that I'm not just running away and giving up on God and this great mission that he has given me. He would say, but man, God is asking a lot. God is asking me to go through persecution. God's asking me to go through giving up comfort. God might even be asking me to give up my life for him. Yes. And let me say this, church. None of those things are unreasonable. None of them. Remember, Christ gave it all. Christ held nothing back. Christ didn't get to the cross and had one nail in and he's, they're getting ready to hammer his second wrist and he thought, this hurts more than I thought. This isn't worth it. I don't know if I'd signed up for this. Look, these people are cussing me. They're spitting on me. They're turning their back on me. They're worshiping beings other than me. This isn't worth it. I'm calling down the angels and I'm out of here. He didn't do that. He went through it because Christ made a commitment with you. We need to have a commitment with him. Christ actually communicated this very same idea when he told us this in Matthew 16, 24. He said that anyone that would come after him must take up his cross and follow him. And he didn't say, you just take up the cross and follow me until it gets really hard. Pick up the cross and follow me until uh, they might kill you. He said, you will follow me. It's important there that illustration that he uses in talking about taking up the cross. Because taking up the cross means that we are absolutely committed and not looking back. That means I'm taking this knowing that it's going to be ugly. Knowing that it's going to be hard. Knowing that there's going to be pain. Knowing that there's going to be heartbreak. Knowing that there's going to be things that happen that I just don't understand and can't make sense of. But knowing the one who I'm following and knowing that no matter what happens, no matter how life looks, no matter how hard it may get, that I know I can trust him. And because he's worthy of following, that's our commitment. We don't quit and lay down our cross halfway through. And then Peter comes, I love what he says here. He says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Arm yourselves. Just as, just as I, I would take up my, my sidearm and arm myself every day when I work on the street. Just as our military will arm themselves with their small arms as they would go out to battle. We are to arm ourselves with the same mind of Christ as we go out. And, and I believe this in Christianity that many of us are defeated in our battles against sin. Because we refuse to sacrifice anything in that battle. We would say, oh i got to fight. I've got to get over this addiction. I've got to get over this sin. I've got to get over this thing in my life. But when it starts heating up and it starts getting hard and we're not really uh, ready to start feeling pain and start feeling sacrifice, we def we're defeated. 
We lay it down. We only want victory if it comes easy. But if it's going to cost me, if I've got to work, if there's going to be pain, then I'm not into that. I'll just, I'll stay right here in my comfort zone. Church, Jesus has called us to have the kind of attitude that would sacrifice in the battle against sin. We, gotta, we, we ought to have this spirit and this attitude that it doesn't matter the cost. It doesn't matter the sacrifice. It doesn't matter the pain. I am so desperate to get rid of this sin in my life. And I, again, I know who I'm following. I know who is leading me. That I don't care about it. We're getting rid of it. And I, because I cannot allow sin to dwell in my life. That's arming ourselves. And the end of verse 1 and, and in verse 2, let me read that. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. This is a golden nugget for you. If you're here this morning and you are a Christian, you're a believer, you've repented of your sin, Christ is your Savior. This is a golden nugget for you. Listen up to this. When a person suffers physical persecution for the sake of Jesus, it almost always radically changes their outlook regarding their sin and the pursuit of the lusts of the flesh. You will meet people in your life, or maybe you'll read their stories in books and magazines or see it in a movie. And it's a real story of their life. And these people have suffered. These people have went through it. I was talking with Brother Russell. We were talking about that magazine, Voice of the Martyrs. And some of you may get that in the mail. You're very familiar with that. Reading of some of these things that people overseas are enduring and going through that, that makes us seem like rainbows and unicorns. I guarantee you, you meet those people or you talk to them before they went through it and after, they are changed. They see things completely different. They're not holding on to their sin anymore. They're not having those strongholds that are built up in their life. They've been through it, and it wasn't because of anything on their own. They've went through these hardships for Christ. They've come out on the other side, and they know that Jesus Christ is worth the suffering. Peter says that, that, that one is more likely to live the rest of his time in the flesh, the end of verse 2, not for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. You see, when we're tried by fire, when we go through hard things, and it could be a medical thing, it could be a financial thing, it could be a death that you have gone through in your family, it could be a persecution, a spiritual persecution, we come out better for it. We come out grown in our faith. We come out uh, closer to Christ. We come out, and let me tell you, when we come out of those things with wounds and scars, and, and you know what, I may have uh, smoke on my face and war paint and black, and it's just crazy because I look like I've been storming the Normandy beach. It doesn't look pretty, but you know what? I'm not holding on to my sin anymore. I'm holding on to the will of God, and that's my desire because he just pulled me through a time I never thought I'd get through, that I'm running to him and I'm clinging to him. And notice this, and I just want to point this out at the end of verse 2. P Peter's not saying that you can no longer sin here. Do you see that? Um, excuse me, in verse 1. He says, for the he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. He, he's not saying that when you go through these that you will cease from sin. and You'll never sin anymore. I think Wayne Grudem says it the best. He, he says this, whoever has suffered for doing right and has still gone on obeying God in spite of the suffering it involved, has made a clear break with sin. That is a changing point in your Christianity. When you have fought that battle, when you have been in the lowest of the lows, when God has stripped every uh, thing that you thought you needed and you thought you had to have and something that you would have said, I can't get through life without, well, now it's gone, but you have held on to the hands of Jesus through all of that. You've made that clear break with sin. You've shown that my dependence isn't on a person. It's not on a substance. It's not on a sin, that it's on Christ. You are changed, I'm telling you, church. You'll never be the same. And then he, he points out that uh, no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh. No longer should we live in our sin and allow it. No longer should we answer every temptation and sinful impulse. There's times when we all have been there when, man, here comes temptation and we're just so weak. All right, I'm going to do it. Or yeah, here it comes again, here comes that person, or here comes that substance, or here comes that thing that God knows, or that, uh, excuse me, that Satan knows, uh, that's my vice, and, and instead of fighting it, we just give in to it. No longer should a Christian live like that. 
Secondly, we should carefully consider how to live the rest of our time on this earth. I ask you that this morning. How will you live the rest of your days on this earth? Think about that. Some of you, you may only have a week. Some of you, especially some of our younger kids, I pray the Lord blesses them, they may have 80 years. But no matter how many days you have left on this earth, how will you live the rest of those days? I remember my mama growing up in church and at home telling me that. She goes, um, you know, I want you to think about when you die or think about when Jesus comes to take you home, the last thing that you're going to be doing. Boy, if that didn't put shame in you as a kid, I don't know what did. Because every time I would go do something I wasn't supposed to be doing, I was thinking about that moment. Man, here I am looking at pornography again. What if Jesus came back now and took me? And that's, where, that's what would be left up. Or man, here I'm going out with my friends and I'm, I'm using language that has no business coming out of my mouth. And, and I'm sitting in a bar and I have no business being in here with my... What if Jesus came and he took me up in a bar? Like we, we need to think about those things. How are we going to spend the rest of our life on this earth? Are we going to be spending it satisfying the lusts of our flesh, doing what Drew wants to do, living how Drew wants to live? Or will we do it serving God, doing things that please Him, loving others and serving them as well? Church, we need to be people of commitment. We need to be a people that are committed to the church. We need to be a people that are committed to our family. This is a huge issue. It's an issue of faith. It's an issue at every church across North America is we live in a culture today that preaches against commitment. You don't need to get married. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that because then you're tied down. Jesus is the one that started the tie downs because it's good for our life. I mean, think about what the very bond of salvation is. It is a commitment. That God says, I will love you, and I have saved you, and I will bless you, and I will give you a home in eternity, and I will give you joy abundant on this earth. We're entering into commitment with him at the moment of salvation, saying, I love you. You're my Lord. You have died for me. You've forgiven me. I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to praise you and give you the glory for everything that I do. It's all about commitment. But the world has crept into the church. And I think I've told you this stat before, but I have a hard time with this, church. That in 2022, the recent stats that have come out, a regular church attender, a regular church attender is one who attends services two times a month. That's regular. That may be the stat, and I absolutely believe it's accurate. I have a hard time with that. Because Christ has called us to commitment. We have families today who the dad can never be home for his kids because work is so taxing and more important. Or even moms are doing the same thing. Or maybe we are home, but we're so stuck in this. Or we've got so many other things going on that we're not committed to our family and it's all falling apart. Why? Because it's not God's design. We've got to be people that are committed to the Lord, to the church, to our families. Number two, we need to possess an attitude of wisdom. An attitude of wisdom. Verse 3, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. I mean, Peter comes right here in verse 3 and just gives us the smack right across the face. He's like, wake up. Do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying, the time has passed for you to live like the Gentiles. What he means is that for you to stop living like the world, for you to stop uh, living in those lusts of your flesh, for you to stop being the center of your own little world. He says, wake up. Get out of that. God has called you out of that. He's called you beyond that. Church, what a waste of time it is for us to live like the world. Think about how many years you have wasted Think about how many years, and and trust me, it keeps me up at night, how many years I have wasted in my life living for me, not doing anything for the cause of Christ, not telling anyone about his name, not doing anything to further a kingdom of God. What a waste of time. It's time to start living like Christians. It's time to start remembering what is more important than my job, what is more important than my wife, what is more important than even my church family, that it is that mission, 
that there are people, your neighbors, your friends, your loved ones, who are dying and going to hell every single day, and we have got to get out and get the message to them. And then I love how Peter, in verse 3, goes on to give us this list. It's, it's almost, again, we relate with Peter. We, can, we know him. He knows us. And it's almost like he's saying, I'm going to give you this list just in case any of you are self-righteous. I'm going to give you this list just in case there's any of you here that are hearing me and reading this and you're thinking, oh, okay, well, I don't live like the Gentiles and I haven't lived like them in a long time and I'm good. I go to church, man. I, I know Pastor Drew and I go to Faith Baptist Church and I got dunked in there and I, I'm, you know, I'm showing up for growth group and, and I'm good. He says, no, let me give you this list just to show you. He says lasciviousness, that's, that's an unbridled lust. That is just that giving in to whatever our flesh wants, whatever we think is going to quench it. Then he goes on and says lust. Then he talks about an excess of wine. Then he goes on and he mentions revelings. Revelings are crazy and drunken partying. That's, we would use the term let loose, right? I just, man, I can't wait. It's Friday night. I can't wait to just go let loose. Let me, let me just go get some alcohol or get drugs or whatever your fancy is, and let's just let it happen. That, that's revelings. Then he says banquetings. That's kind of along the same lines there. Those are get-togethers for drinking. This is, to me, like we're going to get in. Let's, let's just social, right? This is just social. So it's not revelings because we're not going to party, but we're going to be a little bit more tame, and let's just get together. No, that's a banqueting. And he says abominable idolatries. He gives us this list that, guys, every one of us are guilty of. We're all guilty of some, if not all, of these things in the list. And as I read this list, I think about the, the believers at that time. I think about the believers in our time. Here's what I see. I see just how little man has progressed in the last 2,000 years. Because the same things they were dealing with 2,000 years ago are the same things that we're dealing with today. And then he comes to verse 4 and he says, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Christian, you're weird. How many of you already knew this morning that you were weird? Right. We own it, right? It's, it's easy to own. And I love that the Bible just backs us up in this. Now, some of you may be weird because of your quirks. I'm not talking about that kind of weird. Peter's not either. But what Peter is saying here this morning is that the world thinks you're weird. The world is not going to accept you. The world, have you ever had somebody look at you like you got four eyes? Or like you're growing, you know, some kind of an extra limb out of the top of your head. And, and you can just sense it, right? They may not even say anything, but it's just the way that they look at you. You can feel it. And you can sense it. That's what Peter is saying here. He's saying the world is going to think that you are weird. The world is going to think that you're weird because you don't run with them. The world is going to think that you're weird because you don't do all the partying that they do. Because you don't say the same filthy words that they do. Because you don't have the same immoral living standards that they do. And they're going to look at that and they're going to say, you are not from this planet. You are weird. And we would say, amen. Yet we have got to get through our thick skulls as believers to not take this stuff personal. We've got to get through our thick skulls as believers to not always think that we have to fit in. You see, this cultural Christianity has been a downfall. We can't blend in. We can't make the world love us. We can't create an environment where they're going to come in and feel 100% happy and welcome and this is just their home. Without Christ, it's not their home. They're different. We're different. They think that we're weird. And notice, because of that, not just do they think that we're weird, he says this, they're going to speak evil of you. They're going to say things about you. You're going to hear rumors that are started about you. You're going to have people slander your name in the name of this church and those Christians and the people of God. It's going to happen. Do you know why? Because your very presence around them convicts them. If you're living right, they know it. They can feel it. Because you're standing out and you say, nope, I'm not going to do that thing. Nope, I'm not going to go to that place. Nope, I'm not going to laugh at that or say that or think that thing. You're standing out. That convicts them. They'll never admit it to you, but the Bible's telling you it does. The Holy Spirit is working. And so because of that, because you're weird to them, because your presence convicts them, do not be shocked when the rumors and the slander start about you and your family and your church. It's going to happen. 
But don't worry, God's got your back continually. Look at verse 5. He says, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? What this verse is saying is this. Oh, they will slander you. Oh, they'll talk about you. Oh, there'll be all kinds of railings about your name and about the Christian church. But know this, that they will answer for their sins and slanderings one day. They will stand before that judge. They will answer for every thought. They will answer for every word, just as we will in our life, yet we are forgiven. They have not been. And they will see, I love what it says, they will see how wrong and foolish they have been. They will see that even though you were the one who stood out about around hundreds of people, you were the one oddball who stood out in the midst of a crowd, a massive crowd, they will look back and while they were in the majority then, they will see very quickly that they were in the minority. And in verse 6, for this cause, for for this cause, was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Judgment is coming, church. And I know we can get comfortable in this world. Maybe we, when's the last time we've even thought about uh, what is to come and the end times, but judgment is coming. And because of judgment, because judgment is coming, that ought to put an urgency on our hearts as believers. Because, because of the gospel, because of judgment, the gospel must be preached. And you say, who do I preach it to? Do I just preach it to those who will listen? Do I just preach it to those who might come to church? Do I just preach it to those who look good and maybe those who don't smell bad and those of a certain race? No, let me tell you, God wants the gospel preached to all men. Not just your family. Not just Polk City people, North Lakeland people. We need to preach the gospel to all men. And if they will not hear it, if they will not respond to it, then he says this, that they're already dead in their sins, and they will at that point be judged as men in the flesh. But you've done your job. But if they will receive Christ, if they will hear you, and not a raise of hands this morning, but for those of you in here who have had an opportunity to lead someone to the Lord, that is a life-changing experience. Oh my goodness, to know that God used you and used your words and maybe you were there and they prayed with you and you heard them with their words, repent. If they will hear you, then they can live according to God in the Spirit. But church, we've got to have and we must live with an attitude of wisdom. Everything that we say, are we using our minds? Are we using our wisdom? Every place that we go, are we using our wisdom? Every fork in the road that we come to, every decision, every time we need discernment in life, are we used to using the wisdom that God has given us? Number three, and this will be a real short one, just one verse. We need to possess an attitude of prayer. An attitude of prayer. Look with me at verse seven. But the end of all things is at hand. Boy, that says it. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Christians that are in here that, that you truly believe the return of Jesus is very soon. Let me ask you this question. Shouldn't we be making prayer more important in our life than we ever have before? Shouldn't we ever be making prayer more important in our life than ever before? It is sickening in my own life how many times I will preach this, I believe it, I absolutely have seen it work in my life, but how many times I, in the flesh, will go through days and say, man, prayer was not an important priority to me today. Man, God put this person or this thing on my heart, and, and, and I got caught up in my busyness, and you can even get caught up in ministry. That doesn't substitute your, your personal walk with Christ. And man, I did not devote prayer to that like I should. Folks, I want you to think just for a minute, and let's just imagine that Christ was returning tonight. And you've got lost family members, and you have health needs, and you've got financial needs, and you've got things even today that need to be fixed that are not being fixed. And if you know Christ was coming back tonight, that for that person you've been praying for, tonight was their last opportunity to meet their Savior. Don't you think that prayer would be a little bit more important to us? But we become comfortable. We become complacent. And then he comes there and he says, he says this, to, to be sober. Be sober. That, that word means this, to, to be serious-minded. 
not clouded by intoxication, not clouded by sin, that, that, that our prayer life shouldn't be flippant, that our prayer life shouldn't just be, oh, Lord, thank you for this steak. It's so wonderful and the sunshine that you gave today. Amen. That's great and all, but that's not being serious-minded. Serious-minded is, is, is like I heard uh, one of the accounts, I forget who it was, uh, that uh, was praying so much. His, he wrote this sermon, and it was called The Knees of a Camel. He said, I was on my knees so much. I was in so much agony over these requests in my life. I, just, I was praying, and, and, and you talk about being sober-minded and serious-minded. He said, when I came up, my knees, they just had these calluses, and they were white, and they were bleeding. They looked like the knees of a camel. Church, that is serious prayer. And you have needs in your life. Every one of you in here, every one of you that are tuned in who, in, who knows wherever across the United States, you have needs in your life today that are that serious. And we need to pray with that seriousness. But then he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't say prayer is important, that you just need to be sober-minded. But he says this, that we need to be watchful. We need to watch in our prayers this means this, primarily having our hearts and minds watching and ready for the return of Jesus Christ. You know, again, we think about if Christ came back tonight, that's it, we're gone. Not only are we outwardly focused, thinking, is my wife ready, is my husband ready, are my children ready, are my grandchildren ready, but how about ourselves? Am I ready? You heard that old term, getting caught with your pants down, right? What a shame it would be for Christ to return. And we've been so focused on our sin. I've been so focused on my hobbies. I've been so focused on the world that I have not prepared myself for the return. And I have to spend an eternity in hell. He says, be watchful. This means watching ourselves, watching this world, measuring our readiness for the coming of Christ. And church, we as end-time Christians should have an attitude of prayer. It's serious. The last one this morning, we should possess an attitude of love. An attitude of love. Look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. That word charity in the Greek is is directly um, translated to the word love. And this verse should ring familiar to you. This is our verse of the month. We've been saying it every week this for the month of October as we have ended the service. If we truly believe that we're in those last days, if you're here and you truly believe that the coming of Christ could be at any moment, then we have got to start acting like it as believers and we have got to start loving the ones who we are going to spend eternity with doesn't mean you're going to like everybody. We've talked about that before. It doesn't mean that everything, you're never going to have problems in the church. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have another problem with another believer. And sometimes that results in the believers having to leave that church and go elsewhere. That's okay. That doesn't mean that I don't love them anymore. And this attitude that I have seen growing up, this attitude that still exists today, that if you aren't part of this clique and part of this club, that you're dead to me, that is sinful. That's unbiblical. That is unscriptural. I remember my grandpa telling me, who was a pastor, you, you were talking about heroes in the growth group hour. He was my hero. He was uh, just the spiritual man that I needed that I didn't have in my, my earthly dad, who I love very much and is still alive. Many of you have met him. But I remember my grandpa telling me, he goes, listen, people are going to hurt you in the church. Pastors may hurt you in the church, but you still love them, he said, because God has a sense of humor. And he said, you can go in life hating them. You can, you know, you'll see them walking in a door and you turn around and walk the other way. That, you can do all of that stuff. But knowing God's sense of humor, that's the very mansion he'll build right next to yours is that person's. Or as we all stand in that giant worship service that will be going on continually to worship the Lord, you're going to look up and guess who's right next to you. It's Ugly Mug who you couldn't stand on this earth. We are called to love one another as believers. And notice this, that Peter, in his words there in that verse, doesn't just say that we're to love them. He uses a descriptor with it. He describes it as a fervent love. That word fervent means this, an intentional love, or a stretched out love, a sacrificial love that would go out of their way for this person. This is not a fake love. There's a lot of fake love that goes on. 
There's a lot of fake love that goes on on Sunday mornings. There's many times where, hey, how are you? It's the only time I've seen you this week. It's the only time I thought about you this week. If you called me this week, I just screened you four times. You know, I didn't want to talk to you. That's not real love. Peter is saying you love one another fervently. You love one another passionately and intently like you really are brothers and sisters in Christ, which we are. And he says there in that verse, and this is so special, that that love, that kind of love, that authentic love will cover a multitude of sins. It'll cover a multitude of sins for the person that I'm loving, but it will also, praise the Lord, and we all need this, will cover a multitude of sins for myself. Wayne Grudem again says this, where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even some large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. Let that soak into the old sponges for a minute. Now let me clarify this. He's not saying there that it's okay to sin. He's not saying that because I love Johnny and Johnny has some great sin in his life that, well, we'll just shove it under the rug and not deal with it. That's not what he's saying. But it is saying this, because I love Johnny so much, because he's my brother in Christ, because I remember what Jesus has done for me, I remember the sins of my own life, that just as Christ giveth more grace to me, I give more grace to him. That because Johnny's in sin, and he's got the right heart, and he's repentant, you know what? I don't have to blow it up and make it a federal matter. I don't have to take it to social media. I don't have to take it to all my friends. I don't have to take it to the pastor down the street and blow it up. Do you know why? Because I love him. And it's not just words, but I actually mean it. And because he would do the same for me, boy, can't I show him some grace. But Grudem finishes up. He says this, but where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion. Every action is liable to misunderstanding. And conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delight. You show me the chaos churches across our country, I'll show you a church that doesn't have true love. You show me, especially in these legalistic churches where, man, if you don't walk the line and toe it and you step out once and you're out, man, you are off the Christmas card list, I'll show you no love. Verse number nine. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to read it twice because I, I want this to sink into the old sponge too. Others will see true love in our life by our hospitality towards others in the church. Others will see true love in our life by our hospitality towards others in the church. It's easy for anybody to say, I love you. It's easy for anybody to say, I love my pastor, I love my congregation, or I love, I love Faith Baptist Church, but it's just talk. How do we know that that person means it? How do we know that there's truth behind what they say? Because their actions show it. Because that attribute and characteristic of hospitality is there in their life. And notice how Peter uh, talks about and describes this. He says this, that we should show hospitality toward others without grudging. That means this, without grumbling, without murmuring. If I invite you over to my house, or let's just say you show up, right? Let's just say you just show up to my house unannounced. I got to go put pants on. You know, I mean, we're scrambling. My wife's in her nighty. No, it's, 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 I can say that. She's, you just show up and you're there. Okay. I can, I can be friendly and say, man, I'm glad to see you. Come on in. And you come on in and go sit down. And then I turn around and I'm running you down the road to my wife. I can't believe that. Who's that stinking redneck just shows up and just does. You know what I mean? That's not hospitality. I let you in. You're sitting at my table. We may be having a cup of coffee, except I don't like coffee. So you would be having coffee and I would be having tea. But I'm grumbling and I've got a bad spirit. That's not hospitality. That's why I've explained to you as a church, and I'm passionate about this, that there is a difference between being a friendly church and a welcoming church. You can have nice people in the church. You can have good old boys and girls in the church. But if you are not welcoming, then you're not being Christ-like. And let me give you some examples of this, and I'm fixing to get myself fired here. That's okay. God's called me to discern the word and preach it to you. That's what I'm going to do. Let me tell you how this can rear its head in the church. 
You come to church on Sunday morning and somebody's sitting in your seat. Oh, yeah. We're getting deep. You're at a crossroads. Now, I would hope, and I have seen people dumb enough to do this before in my, in my 36 years as a Baptist, that actually had the gall to walk up to that person and say, excuse me, you're in my seat. If that ever happens at Faith Baptist Church, I will smack you across the head with my Bible, and I will go to jail. It'll be worth the night in jail. But here's what happens, because most of us are not dumb enough to say those things. Here's what happens. You will come in, and you will see someone in your seat, and you start getting hot under the collar real quick. I've been sitting in that seat for 20 years. That seat's mine. It's got my butt imprint sitting on there. They shouldn't even be comfortable sitting in that seat right now. And we walk away. Now, we haven't been rude to that person, right? But what's going on in our heart? We're grumbling. We're murmuring. That is not hospitable. It goes against what, what uh, Peter is, is saying here. How about this? Sometimes, uh, some, some of you may have a call or you feel like you want to get involved in a ministry in a church and, and the pastor uh, or who the, the leaders in the church, they put someone else in that position. Or they put someone else and you're grumbling about them. And you may not go up and say, you didn't deserve that, you don't earn that, my giftings and callings are better than you in there. We won't say those things, right? But we're thinking it. We're thinking, why in the world, why in the world did they put Brother Calvin over that? I, I mean, I've shown myself more dedicated than him. I've shown myself more skilled than him. I could do a better job. All those times when they had needs in that area, and, I, and he wasn't there to do it, I was there. We're not being hospitable. Because there's grumblings in my heart. How about this? You always have needy people in the church that are more needy than someone else. Someone that comes in and, and they have physical needs or they have financial needs or uh, they have emotional needs or spiritual needs. They're always coming and I need this and give me that. Uh, and have you ever thought in your heart, man, that person is so needy. I'm not giving them a dime. All they do is ask for stuff. All they do is, is need things, and they can never be sufficed. They can never be uh, satisfied with things that they have. We'll never say that and show our grumblings to them, but we're not being hospitable to them in our heart. And the last example is this. Hospi not having hospitality in your life looks like this. Never getting beyond surface relationships. Unhospitable people never deeply know anyone in the church. Because, again, we've bought into this whole thing that Sunday morning, you're my friends, I love you, I've been thinking about you all week, knowing that's all lies, how are you doing, everything's great, everything's wonderful, and then Sunday afternoon, I'm out of here because i got to get down to the restaurant, i got stuff to do, I'm not thinking about you, I'm not praying for you, and it's shallow. And I'm telling you, we can fake this to the best. But let me ask you this question this morning. How deeply do you know these people in here? From our families, from the east, all the way to the west, or north and south, however our building is. How well do you know each other? How well are you desiring to get to know each other? Is that desire even on your heart? Do you even care about getting to know other people in the church? I don't care how nice you are. I don't care how friendly you may show yourself on Sundays and possibly Wednesday nights. If you are not desiring to get to know and get beyond the shallowness of your relationships, we've got a ton of new families that have joined. How well do you know them? If you'd say, I don't, and I don't really care to, you do not have a hospitable spirit, sir or ma'am. Peter is preaching against this. And you would say, what does hospitality look like? Well, it includes things like opening your homes. Maybe, you know, it's okay for you to invite somebody over for dinner. It's okay for you to host a small group Bible study in your home. How about this? It looks like sacrificing your time. Knowing that, that I've got things to do today. I've got things I've been putting off. I mean, my house is a mess, but, but you know what? Uh, Brother Jay, he, he's got a need today. And so I'll get those things done another day. God will provide the time, but he needs my afternoon. He needs some love. He needs some time. That's hospitable. It looks like this, just being friendly. And I mean real. I mean going out of your way and and, 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 you know, telling Miss Michelle that she's got a prayer need and saying to her, I'm going to pray for you, and I mean it. 
knowing that I'm going to pray over her over lunch, I'm going to pray over her tonight before I go to bed, and whenever else God puts her on my heart. That is what hospitality looks like. You see, being hospitable towards others is to be inconvenienced, but still being cheerful through it. Verse number 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Love will show itself as we give to the church family what God has given us as gifts. You see, that's what makes you and I good stewards of God's grace. All around the room here today, you have different gifts. Some of you are gifted uh, in carpentry work. Some of you are gifted in plumbing work. Some of you are gifted in, I guess, talking to people because I'm not going to say preaching. Others of you are gifted in music. We all have these different gifts that the Bible talks about. What are you doing with those gifts? Are we only using those gifts at our job? Are we only using those gifts for our family or in our social circles? Or are we using those gifts that God gave us for God? Are we returning that favor? Are we using our talents in the church? You see, God gives us those gifts, yes, so that we can excel in areas of our life. But they're not to be just wasted on worldly things. Verse 11, and this is where we'll end this morning. He says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, Peter describes a couple types of people here that uh, ultimately encompasses all of us in the service of God. He specifically mentions those who speak, that would be uh, teachers, that would be pastors, those who are speaking as the oracles of of God, But he also talks about those who minister, and that is all the rest of everyone else. Because if you're not called to preach, if you're not called to teach, which are many, that's okay. Then God has called you to minister in some other way. God's never called you to just sit on your rear end as a believer. No matter what you do in service for the Lord, whether you're called to pastor, some of you are just called to watch infants in the nursery. Praise God for that. Whether you're a teacher or whether you're just called to open your home in hospitality. Whether you lead from the stage or you're the one who prays behind the scenes what Peter's trying to get across, across here. And what I'm pushing is this, that every person matters in the church. There's not one person in the church that you would say they're dead weight and they have no worth. They have no matter. Now, if you're choosing not to do anything, then that's what you're making yourself. You're doing that. But we cannot sit here and say that no one here matters. Because all of you are gifted. All of you have something to offer. All of you, in your own way that God has given you, can help the kingdom of God. Can grow his kingdom in service. Can love one another. I love being able to, to just encourage and get along elderly women who don't have, and men who don't have the physical abilities that they used to. And, and this attitude is common with them. And they would say, I just don't feel like I have any value. I used to do all of these things, and now my, my mind is slipping. My body's definitely not what it could. I can't go out and I can't work, and I, I can't walk and go door to door, and I can't I go out and do outreach, and I just feel worthless. And I always ask them one question. I say, one, I, I, was, I say this, can you pray? Can you pray? Yeah. And it's always like it's a meaningless thing. And I say, well, dear sister, dear brother, then you're the most important part in our church. You continue to pray. You pray deeper because God hears your prayer and he will work through that for the rest of us who can do some of that legwork. But without prayer warriors, we have nothing. And we serve one another. We do it with the strength that God provides, the ability which God supplies, so that to him belongs the praise and the dominion forever and ever. Church, Christ is coming soon. It's imminent. It's imminent. We know that he is coming soon. And he's coming to take his long-awaited bride, the church, to be with him forever and ever. I ask you this morning, are you a part of that bride? Do you know him? Does he know you? If Christ came today to take his bride and to rapture the church, would you be with him? Would you be taken up in the clouds? Or would you be left behind? It's not about your works. 
It's not about who you know. It's not about your faithful church attendance. It's not about your tithing. It's not about the fact that you are proud that you are a Baptist. It's not about any of those things. It's about your repentance and your faith. Have you ever repented of your sin? Has there ever been a time in your life where you asked Christ to save you, to forgive you of your sin, where you put your faith and trust in him? If your answer this morning is no, then I implore you to repent of your sin and believe on Christ at once. Because it could be today. Christians that are here, how's your end time attitude? Do you have an attitude of commitment today? Are you committed to the things that God wants you to commit to? How's your attitude of wisdom? Are you using godly wisdom and having that attitude? Do you have an attitude of prayer? How important is your prayer life? When's the last time where you couldn't get enough of talking to God? When's the last time that, that you were so desperate to have him answer this need in your life that nothing else mattered? And how's your attitude with love? How's your love for one another? How's your love for him? I can't help but feel that there are many of us in here this morning that we need to just get honest with ourselves. And there are some things that we need to repent of. There are some things that we need to confess, get right with the Lord. There are some things that we need to get off our chest and give them to him and he'll forgive us. And that fellowship that we have with him that is broken is restored. What's on your heart this morning? What is God bringing to the surface? And as we prepare to go into invitation, I would just ask this, that you stop ignoring it, that you stop shoving it, that you stop burying it, and that today is the day that you deal with it. You don't have to come forward and make a big deal. We don't have to publicly announce it and say this happened and that happened, but you take care of it with the Lord. But don't you dare walk out of here gambling with your soul. Don't you dare walk out of here with a continued broken relationship with Almighty God. That's not his desire, and it shouldn't be ours either. Let him restore you and forgive you today. Father, we are so grateful for your word. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, and it, Again, this is one of those messages that it is hard for me to preach this because I'm guilty of so much of it. But Father, I'm thankful that in the light of our sin, in the light of really our stupidity, Lord, in the light of our flesh, that you never leave us and you never forsake us. That I can be that prodigal child that has walked away miles down the road, but then I turn and I come back and you're still there. You've always been there. Father, I pray if anyone here this morning is lost, they're not saved. They don't have a hope for heaven. If their life ended today, Lord, I don't care what traditions they may be holding on to. I pray that today you'd convict their heart that they're lost and on their way to hell. I pray that you grant them the repentance, Lord. I pray that you would reveal their sin to them. I pray, Lord, that you would convict their heart so heavy that they can't walk out of here this morning without confessing sin. Lord, I pray for the Christians as well who are beat up, the Christians who are living in the world, the Christians who, who maybe even should be here this morning, and they're not. Lord, I pray that you would convict their hearts now where they are. Lord, help none of us to ever be satisfied where we're at in our Christian life, because we can always do more. There's always something we can confess. There's always something more that I can do for your kingdom, because you're worthy. Father, I pray that today, as you bring those things to our hearts, to the surface of our minds, Lord, that we would confess those and give those to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would stand where you're at in your seats and the ladies are going to